In the United States right now, we have more income and wealth inequality than any other country on earth. We have three people who are more wealth than the bottom half of America. We have the 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 90%. We have 46% of all new income going to the top 1%. Okay? So what we have in America today is a whole lot of wealth. But that wealth and income increasingly goes to the very, very wealthiest people in this country. So what I believe that in a democratic, civilized society, health care, yeah, is a right. Making sure that our kids can get a higher education is a right. That we rebuild our crumbling infrastructure is a basic need. That's going to cost money. But at a time when the people on top have so much, while the middle class shrinks and we have so many people living in poverty, if your question is, am I going to demand that the wealthy and large corporations start paying their fair share of taxes, damn right, I will. All right? And let me give you, you know, people say, where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to get the money? Amazon, owned by the wealthiest guy in the world, made $5 billion last year in profits. Anyone here know how much they paid in taxes? That's right. That's where we're going to begin getting the money. But tax experts caution, and you know this, Senator. <laughs> tax experts caution that the rich will likely look for various ways to avoid paying these taxes. How will you ensure that the wealthy actually go ahead and pay these taxes? Well, that's what they do right now. Look, we got a, we have a, an economy today that works very well for the 1%. And what these guys do, and we have to deal with this, they stash billions and billions of dollars in profits in the Cayman Islands and other tax havens. And we have veterans sleeping out on the streets, public schools that are falling apart. Got 20% of senior citizens in this country trying to live on $13,500 or less. So we have, when I talk about a political revolution, I know this may sound, sound radical to some people, but we are going to create an economy and a government that works for all of us, not just the 1%. So to answer your question, we are going to do away with those outrageous loopholes that allow large corporations owned by some of the wealthiest people in this country to pay nothing in taxes. We're going to end their ability to put their money in the Cayman Islands under the tax havens. I talk about the fact that we have a nation of massive inequality, okay? and I believe that. I think that's the most important issue we can talk about. But within that inequality, we have another inequality, and that is racial disparity. And it's important that everybody understands that. That means that the wealth gap between a white family and a black family is 10 to 1. If you are a black mother, the likely it is that you, are, you, you will have a baby that will die. Your infant mortality rate two and a half times higher than a white mother. If you are a black businessman, I remember talking to a fellow in Milwaukee, black businessman, said, Bernie, I can't get a loan from the bank. And his business is pretty good because of redlining. Black kids are leaving college more deeply in debt than white kids. So we have an enormous amount of disparity in wealth, in education, in health that must be addressed. And I will work as hard as I can, number one, to have a cabinet that reflects what America is, and number two, to do everything that I can in every way to end all forms of racism in this country. The pharmaceutical industry is the most greedy entity in this country today. Today in America, if you can believe it, one out of five people cannot afford the medicine that they need. You talk about insulin? We have had on our social media, my Senate social media, parents talking about how their children died because they couldn't afford insulin. The pharmaceutical industry last year made $50 billion in profit. $50 billion, they pay their CEOs outrageous levels of compensation. 
and one out of five Americans cannot afford the medicine they need. In my state of Vermont, elderly people cut their pills in half. Now, I have introduced, I think, the most sweeping set of legislation to deal with this issue. It does three things. Uh, number one, it has Medicare, for the first time, negotiating prices with the pharmaceutical industry. You know why our prices are so much higher than any other country on earth? In America, the drug companies could charge you any price they want. They could double, triple, quadruple the price. They get what the market will bear. Every other country on earth negotiates prices. And we don't, because the pharmaceutical industry has unbelievable money and unbelievable power. All right? So number one, Medicare negotiates prices. Number two, many of my Republican friends believe in free trade. Well, if you believe in free trade, why can't pharmacists and distributors purchase lower cost prescription drugs from Canada and other countries. Same exact medicine made in the same factories, bring them into America. Thirdly, roughly speaking, what Canada does. What Canada does is look at prices around the world, come up with an average price, and that's what people pay in Canada. We should do something similar. But let me say this, and this gets at the heart of what our campaign is about. The drug companies have so much wealth and so much power that they are not going to be easy to defeat. I was involved in a situation in California where we tried to, people in California tried to lower prices. Do you know how much money the drug company spent in one state on one referendum? Anyone want to guess? $131 million. Okay, they have endless amounts of money. So in my campaign, we announced today, I'm getting a little off topic here, that we have signed up a million people to participate in the campaign. And the reason we are going to run an aggressive grassroots campaign is that at the end of the day, you don't beat the pharmaceutical industry here in Washington, D.C. They own the Congress. That's the fact. They have lobbyists all over the place. The only way you beat the drug companies is when millions of people stand up and say, you're not going to allow my, I'm not going to allow you to kill my wife or my kids. We're not going to pay outrageous prices. All right. Senator, that's a long answer to an important question. The United States, shamefully, is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people. We've got 30 million people today without any health insurance. Many of you are underinsured with high deductibles and high copayments, and we pay the highest prices in the world by far for prescription drugs. So issue number one, I believe that health care is a human right not a privilege, and we've got to guarantee health care to all of our people as a right. Number two, if we're going to do that in a cost-effective way, if we're going to make sure that we are not spending huge amounts of money, and in fact, lower the amount of money we're spending, we're now spending almost twice as much per capita on health care as any other country. That is unsustainable. The estimates is that in the next 10 years, we're going to spend $50 trillion on health care. The only way to provide health care to all people in a cost-effective way is a Medicare for all single-payer program. All right? That's what I believe, and that's what I will fight for. Now, good news is, before I ran for president in 2016, that was considered to be a wild and crazy idea. Today, a significant majority of the people support that concept. Now, the drug companies don't. The insurance companies don't because they make billions of dollars every single year off of our wasteful and dysfunctional health care system. So I'm going to fight as hard as I can. There's going to be a bill introduced in the House, I believe, this week, over 100 co-sponsors. We're going to reintroduce a bill in the Senate, I believe, 16 co-sponsors. We are making real progress. Senator, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, Medicare for all, because about half of Americans, as you know, they're insured by their employer right. plans. According to a recent Gallup poll, 70 percent of these people with private health insurance, their plans, they like their plans. They think their plans are good. Will these people be able to keep their health insurance plans, their private plans no. through their employers? If there is a Medicare for all program that you endorse. What they will what will change in their plans is the color of their card. So instead of having a Blue Cross Blue Shield card, instead of having a United Health Insurance card, they're gonna have a Medicare card. That Medicare card will allow them both to go to any doctor, 
that they want. If they're going to the doctor, they're happy. Any hospital they want. But you know what else? They're not going to be paying any private insurance premiums. If they are seniors, we are going to expand Medicare benefits to cover dental care, which is not covered for seniors, hearing aids, and eyeglasses. Our bill covers all health care needs, all. If people want cosmetic surgery, for example, yes, of course, they can get private insurance. But our bill covers all comprehensive health care needs. We live in a competitive global economy. And if this economy in the United States is going to work, we need to have the best educated workforce in the world. 30 or 40 years ago, we actually did. We no longer do have the best educated workforce. And you indicated the reason why. Right now, you've got hundreds of thousands of bright young people who cannot afford to go to college. We have young people like you who do go to college and they leave school fifty, dollars $100,000 in debt. I will never forget in Burlington, Vermont, talking to a young physician and she said, Bernie, I graduated medical school, $300,000 in debt. So a dentist in Iowa, $400,000 in debt. Frankly, that is crazy. We want you to get the best education you can without having to pay off outrageous levels of debt for decades. So what is the answer? The answer, in fact, is to understand that a higher education today is the equivalent of what a high school education was 40 or 50 years ago. And that means we make public colleges and universities tuition free and we substantially lower the outrageous levels of student debt. Right now, you have young people carrying debt with interest rates of 6, 7, 8%, and that is nuts. And then people are going to, Wolf is going to ask me in three minutes, how are we going to pay for that? <laughs> yes, Wolf? Go ahead. All right. All right. <laughs> and we're going to pay for that by a tax on Wall Street speculation. That's how we do it. And that covers that. Should, should private. Should private universities be held responsible for the very high tuition that's, under, that's going on right now? I think they need to do a lot of examination, and some of them are. And, uh, what do you think they should do? Uh, I think maybe they don't want to build huge football stadiums. Uh, and I think maybe they don't want to necessarily pay their football coaches far more than they pay anybody else on their faculty. Uh, but I think as a nation, uh, we are going to have to take a hard look at higher education, and not just higher education, by the way. Talk about education, talk about a dysfunctional child care system where working families all over this country cannot find quality, affordable child care. So we gotta, we gotta get our priorities right, not for tax breaks, for billionaires, but for education for all of our kids. Most countries with developed economies offer public preschool as a standard benefit to all of their three and four year olds. America does not, as we know. Instead, low-income parents here scrambled for scarce public spots while middle-income families scrambled to pay for increasingly costly private preschool. Very few can afford the cost of quality care. If you become president, will you support efforts to offer high-quality, optional, publicly funded preschool for all Americans? Want a one-word answer? Absolutely. Yes. All right, and I'll tell you why. Thanks for asking that question. This is an issue that does not get enough attention. Every psychologist in the world, what do they tell us? They tell us that the most important years of human development are zero through four for intellectual and emotional development. And yet we have a system which is basically dysfunctional, as you described. You have workers who are underpaid, and yet you have parents, working class people, who cannot afford the care that they need. And many kids are not getting the kinds of nourishment, intellectual and emotional, that they need. And you know what all of the studies tell us? Is that when you invest in pre-K education and you make sure that kids are prepared for school, they are much less likely to drop out. They are much less likely to do bad things and end up in jail. Every dollar you invest in preschool education will be paid back many, many times. So we got a lot of work to do in education, from higher education to preschool to improving our public schools as well. 
And when people tell me we cannot afford to do that, I say we cannot not afford to do that. This is the future of the country. As a strong advocate for raising the federal minimum wage to $15, I've had many discussions with my peers in regard to this matter. Many expressed concerns that small business owners would have to lay off employees because they do not have the money and income to support that many workers at that rate. How do you reassure them that this would not be the case and it is in fact possible? Well, you're right. Um, in 2016, when I ran for president and we talked about raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, Everybody said, well, it's pretty radical, pretty extreme. Well, a lot has changed in three years. Mm -hmm. And right now, you've got five states in this country that have passed $15 an hour minimum wage. And by the way, it means phasing it in over a period of years, not tomorrow. But here's what I believe. I believe that in the richest country in the history of the world, if you work 40 hours a week, you should not be living in poverty. And I believe that if we raise that minimum wage to $15 an hour, workers will have more money to spend in their community and create jobs doing that. So I think raising the minimum wage is the right thing to do, and I think it is good economics, and I'm very delighted to see the kind of progress we're making uh, in states and cities all over this country. Senator Sanders, uh, can you make a simple persuasive case as to why socialism is preferable to capitalism? Democratic socialism, right? Yes. Okay. Let's, let me, uh, tell you what I mean by that so we're clear. Right now, we have a nation which prides itself on a lot of political rights. In other words, under the Constitution, thank God you have freedom of speech. Media can do its thing, even though Trump calls you an enemy of the people. How does that feel to be an enemy? That's another story. All right. <laughs> I won't question Wolf. Uh, you don't think we are, though? No, I don't. Okay. I certainly do not. Uh, so we have political right, freedom of religion. And all of that is enormously important. But you know what we don't have? We don't have guarantees regarding economic rights. And way back in 1944, in a little known, a little publicized State of the Union speech, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said something. And I'm paraphrasing him. But he said, you know, when we talk about human freedom and rights, we've got to understand that everybody needs a decent paying job that people need health care, that people need education. And all over the world, these ideas are taking place. You go to countries in Scandinavia, of course health care is a right. Higher education is free. They have strong uh, preschool uh, programs. They make sure that their elderly folks can retire in dignity. These are not radical ideas. So what democratic socialism means to me is having in a civilized society, the understanding that we can make sure that all of our people live in security and in dignity. Healthcare is a human right. All people should have healthcare. You can't get ahead in this country, in this world, unless you have a decent education. We have got to, as a right, end the kinds of discrimination, the racism and the sexism and the homophobia that exist. So to me, when I talk about democratic socialism, what I talk about are human rights and economic rights. Do you have a clear position on US intervention overseas, both economically and militarily, for nations that are under the regimes of these oppressive dictators? Thank you. Good question. There are a lot of awful things happening in the world. And what's going on in Venezuela is terrible. The economy is a disaster. People are living in hunger and in fear. Uh, I strongly believe there has to be an international humanitarian effort to improve lives for the people. I think the evidence is pretty clear that the last election in Venezuela was not a free and fair election. And under international supervision, I want to see a free and fair election. But to answer your question, let me say this. I am old enough to remember the war in Vietnam. And I was as active as I could trying to keep the United States from going to war in Iraq. I was in the Congress at that point. And I am very fearful of the United States continuing to do what it has done in the past. As you know, or may know, the United States overthrew a democratically elected government in Chile and in Brazil and in Guatemala and in other countries around the world. 
So as someone who fervently believes in human rights and democracy, we have got to do everything that we can. But I think sometimes you have unintended consequences when a powerful nation goes in and tells people uh, who their government will be. So my view is that whether it is Saudi Arabia, which is a despotic regime, or whether it is Venezuela, I think we have got to do everything that we can to create a democratic climate. But I do not believe in U.S. military intervention in those countries. Hello. Um, my home, the lower eastern shore of Maryland, part of the Delmarva Peninsula, is estimated to be one of the first places in the country to experience the effects of climate change. In fact, with more and more frequent flooding, it already is. What is your plan to help these rural, rural communities in the poorest part of the, our state to fight climate change? What you're asking is maybe, you know, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you were moderating it. Um, well, I don't know if it was you or CBS, I can't remember. And somebody asked me, they said, what is the major national security issue facing this country? And you know what I said? I said climate change. And people laughed. Wasn't that funny? Well, people are not laughing now. Because they have read the scientific reports and they know that if we don't get our act together in the next 12 years or so, there's going to be irreparable damage. Mm -hmm. So let me lay it out on the line. We are going to have to not only take on Trump and his deniers, but we are going to have to take on the power of the fossil fuel industry. That is the coal companies and the oil companies and the gas companies. And we are going to have to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Now, the good news is, is that we know how to do that. The technology is there, and that technology will only improve. And here's the other good news when we make that transformation. We're going to create millions of good-paying jobs, weatherizing our homes, changing our transportation system, moving aggressively into wind and solar and other sustainable energies. But this, to me, is an existential crisis that impacts not just you and me and our generation, but our kids and our grandchildren. And we must accept the moral responsibility of leaving these kids, future generations, a planet that is healthy and habitable. And I will do everything I can to have the United States lead the rest of the world. We can't do it alone. But we can bring India and China and Russia, countries all over the world, together in the fight to transform our energy system and save this planet. To somehow decide this is a national emergency that he's calling in order to build the wall. All right. The real national emergency that we have is that we do not have comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. The emergency that we have is we have 1.8 million young people who are eligible for the DACA program who are scared to death any day that they could be deported even though they were spent their whole lives uh, in this country. So the goal with immigration, in my view, is to finally deal with comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship and a humane policy at the border for those who seek asylum. America should not be the country which grabs little children at the border out of the arms of their mothers. That is not what this country is. As you know, uh, President Trump uh, this week is meeting in Hanoi with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. If you were president, would you meet with Kim Jong-un? See, now, after all of the nasty things I said about Trump, <laughs> let me say a good thing here, all right? <laughs> is, I think, look, uh, nuclear weapons in the hands of a brutal, uh, irresponsible dictator is a bad idea. And if Trump can succeed in fact, through face-to-face uh, -face meetings with Kim Jong-un and rid that country of nuclear weapons, that is a very good thing. So I think uh, that the idea of going and meeting face-to-face -face with your adversaries is a good idea. Mm -hmm. I would like the President of the United States to bring Iran and Saudi Arabia together, to bring the Palestinians and the Israelis together. All right? So... I wish the president the best of luck. This is 
a very important issue. And if we can uh, get nuclear weapons out of the hands of Kim Jong-un, uh, that will be a very good thing.